got a panel on women and film. We have some notable, yes, yes. <laughs> some notable filmmakers, women filmmakers here, and women who write about women in film, uh, who are going to be part of the panel and also presenting. Uh, but I, I'm going to introduce the two people who put this panel and the concept together uh, with me. Uh, Beth Fakunas, who is here and will be coming up in a moment uh, to talk to you. Beth is a filmmaker uh, in her own right and uh, has, uh, does many, many things, <laughs> uh, um, and has been a great help to us during the festival. And Jeremy Bando, who teaches film and is a filmmaker as well, and who uh, made the film that you're about to see about women in film. That said, I know you're going to enjoy this tremendously. Thank you so much for coming out. Here's Beth. Thanks, everybody. Gosh, it's uh, close. Yeah. In here. Cozy. Cozy is what, but we're really, really happy that um, you're all here. And yeah, we'll just maybe end up having a conversation more than anything today. But welcome. Um, the way things are going to go is we're going to show a six minute video about where um, this all started for Women in Film, where we come from. And then we're going to have a 20 minute presentation by um, the esteemed Melissa Silverstein uh, on where we are. And it's facts and figures, and then the panel will be focusing on where we're going, okay? Melissa is a um, writer. For, she has a column at Forbes.com, regular comment, column, Washington Post, LA Times, you, you name it, that um, you can see her work there. She's also the founder of the Women in Hollywood website, which is the premier website for women in film. You must go visit it if you haven't already. Um, and she just got back from India um, with the U.S. envoy for the State Department representing film here in America. Yes? So this is Melissa. So she's going to come. So I introduced her without showing the movie first, but, you know, here we are. Um, so we'll show our little film, and then we'll bring um, Melissa up front. Okay? Terrific. Thank you all. Year is 1905. The woman to the right of the camera directing the film is Alice Guy Blanchet. She was an immigrant from France, obsessed with making movies. For women directors like her, life was good in the early years of cinema. Lois Weber, Ida Mae Park. Dorothy Arzner, Mabel Normand, just some of the names of the women who directed movies in the early 1900s. As filmmaking became big business in the 1910s, fraternal organizations such as the Motion Picture Directors Club and the Athletic Club of Hollywood, groups that later morphed into the guilds, systematically shut women out of the power positions of filmmaking. The men basically told the women to Sois belle et tais-toi. Look pretty and shut up. Dark years followed. From 1943 to 1949, not a single woman directed a Hollywood film. From there, there was nowhere to go but up. And finally, things started to turn around. Thirty-five years ago, in 1979, in Hollywood, six women risked their careers to create change for all women in the industry when they created the Women's Steering Committee of the Directors Guild of America. 
Their work changed the landscape for women directors forever. In 1980, these women launched a landmark class action lawsuit that eventually sent women directors' employment numbers soaring from 0.05% of all films directed in 1985 to 16% in 1995. Good things started happening and great movies were made. Great movies were directed by Sofia Coppola. School and Mrs. Lisbon shut the house in maximum security isolation. Catherine Bigelow. I need, the team. I need to follow this lead or the other thing you're going to have on your resume is being the first station chief to be called before a congressional committee for subverting the efforts to capture or kill bin Laden. Jane Campion. Julie Dash. It ain't right! This was a giant go to heaven. It ain't right. <laughs> Julie Tamor. Salías del templo un día llorona cuando al pasar yo te vi. Catherine Hardwick. Mira Nair. Nora Ephron. Look at that, Julia. It looks just like yours. Anna Lily Amirpour. Just to name a few. So here we are, 2015. Back at the beginning. A woman director, free to direct. The horizon is ablaze with the coming light of an unmitigated female force as we pass our torch to the next generation of women directors. This is a director, Ava DuVernay, Lexi Alexander, Ama Asante, Tope Oshin. This is a director. We still face challenges, but we're on our way. I'm say tangy, people call me my tangy. God is a word, bitches, I'm a kid banging. Truth is like a rotten tooth, you got together by Jeremy and I don't see him there you are all the way in the back ever since we first met and we were on the same um, group or two of us putting with Susan putting this together I've, I've beaten him up I'm like a man can't be on this panel <laughs> <laughs> but he did his great job and now he's hiding so thank you <laughs> I have a presentation now by Melissa Silverstein, and then I will introduce our great panelists. So here we go, Melissa. Jeremy? Okay. Well, I'll put that movie on the site, okay? I know you don't have any clearances, right? No. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> hi, you don't think you want to take it down? I'll take it down. Hi, I'm Melissa Silverstein. I'm from New York. I'm um, probably going to say a couple of bad words because that's what we do in New York, but I just want to build on what Jeremy said because 16%, uh, 15% in 1995, you will see in a couple of minutes that we're not at 15% any longer. There was a high point, now we're drastically lower. So um, 
I'm really honored to be a part of this festival and I thank you all for coming here. And so I want to talk a little bit about the status of women in Hollywood. So here we go. This is why I do this work. Okay, so I have a four-year-old nephew um, and he took me to his bedroom, he took my hand and he said, look, meet my friends. <laughs> and these were his friends. And this is the, book, the, you know, the wall in his room and he knows every single Star Wars character, four years old, now he's five, and I told him, I said, oh, I love Star Wars too, where are the girls? And he's like, oh yeah, there's one right there. And we all know, you know, Princess Leia was in a bikini, and that was the only Star Wars female character we have. This weekend was actually a big Star Wars weekend. They had the big biannual thing in LA where they released the trailer for the new Star Wars movie, which I will see with my nephew who's now six, which is amazing, the cross-generational stuff that you could do with Star Wars. 30 million people watched that trailer in 24 hours. These are our stories. And these are stories where women are missing. So I want people to understand, and I love that the girls are here, because you are our future. And I want people to understand where we are in Hollywood and why this is a crisis. And I use this word crisis because we are half the world and our stories are missing. My Twitter friend right here, we talk all the time on Twitter. I'm completely addicted to Twitter. And so um, let's keep going. What is women in Hollywood? Educates, advocates, and agitates for gender equity. Can you guys see? No. Um, I don't know what to say then. I spend a lot more time now agitating, but I'm okay with that. Next. Um, so here are the numbers. These numbers were done by academics, not me. I have not made up anything in this. This is all real. 17%. That's everyone behind the scenes. Next. One point increase from 1998. I'm sorry, same as 1998. Next, top 250 movies. So 250 movies is a lot of movies. 23% of producers, these are great numbers, right? 23, okay, we have a quarter of the world. Next, these numbers get 11% of writers. So that means 10, you know, a one tenth of basically all scripts written at the top 250 grossing movies are written by women and 7% of directors, 1% of composers. Ridiculous. Next. Okay, so then I was like, at Women in Hollywood, I was like, I really want to count what the studios do, because they don't tell us, you know, they're not going to show these numbers. 6.4% of the feature films were directed by studios, and that's six years. 6.4. These are basically all the movies you see in your main, in your main theaters are 6.4% directed by women. 4.6 in last year, and only one woman has directed a movie five years, twice. <clears throat> she has a movie coming out this year. Next. And these are the numbers from the studios. Warner Brothers, 2.3%. <coughs> I'm gonna stand in that corner. Think that'll be better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Here we go. Next. There are multiple things in these, so you can just keep going, thanks. So, and then 10% of indies, we didn't get to 214 yet. So everyone's like, okay, indie world, so much better for women, right? Not that much better. The, we, we counted. See, the language is shifting. People are talking about this online. We're having this really robust dialogue, but the problem is the numbers are not moving. We need these numbers to move. Next. So this is how Hollywood works. There are these six people, six entities, all cogs in multinational corporations. They used to be self-owned theaters when those guys that you saw in the video created them. Now they're cogs in multinational wheel. Uh, next. These are the smaller indies. If you look at um, Lionsgate, Lionsgate's a place that actually has a lot of women on screen. You, this is where our Twilight comes from, this is where our Divergent comes from, and this is where our, what's the one with the, the other one, with the oh, Jennifer Lawrence. Hunger Games. Oh, Jesus, Hunger Games. That's the studio. Next, how Hollywood works. Everything's about the opening weekend. We put as many, we put this movie on as many screens as possible. Gen, uh, Avengers Ultron, right, it's gonna open, I would say it's gonna open on like 4,000 screens. Make as much money as I can on the opening weekend. All you, you guys go to multiplex here, right? 
right? So all 80% of all movies are seen in multiplexes with eight screens or more. So it's Avengers Ultron at four, Avengers Ultron at 415, Avengers Ultron at 430. And then it just keeps going like that all weekend long. And that's how women get shut out because we don't have access to these multiplexes for our movies. Next. And the, oh no. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know exactly when um, opening weekend box office became news, but now you know on Sunday night when you're getting your weather report, you know, I'm going to wear an umbrella tomorrow, I'm going to wear a sweater, you know the five top movies that opened that weekend. So when you go to the office the next morning, you're just like, did you see this? Did you see this? This is how we communicate with people. These are our cultural conversations. Next. Now we're about women. If you don't remember anything I say today, remember this. They think we don't go to the movies. We buy half the tickets, as you will see. This is really important. Stories about women are not valued as much as stories about men. Male stories are the norm. Female stories are over there girly things, pink things. I don't want to know about them. Women are not a market. They don't think we buy tickets. And then we can't direct big budget movies. These are the narrative of how Hollywood exists. And we, our job is to break that down. Next. So here's the, another thing to, that's really important. America, they don't care about us anymore. They don't care about us because 72 cents of every dollar is made outside the United States and Canada. So all they care about is China and India and Russia. And that's what they're making these movies for. Next. But they say, right, we don't go to Walmart, we don't buy tickets, look. Women, men. Oh my god, we might have the tickets. <laughs> and let's look at the next slide. And it's not been, it's not like we haven't been buying half the tickets. We've been buying half the tickets for as long as they've been putting out the data. So this whole mythology about how women are not part of the system and that all the movies are, should be geared for the 15-year-old boys who are the ones that go to the movies all the time is a lie. Next. And this is from the MPAA, the organization that lobbies for those six theaters that you saw before. And they know, they know that we are the ticket buyers. And so uh, we have to change people's mentality who make the decisions in Hollywood. Next. And then understand, young people go to the movies more. This is not an untruth. You got to have a lot more time. You go on dates. You go in groups. It's the way it goes. You don't have a lot of things to do. But it's not that the boys are going more than girls. Girls are going as much as boys are. Next. So the next part of this is going to be a bunch of movies that I've put together to talk about debunking this narrative about the success of women. My Big Fat Greek Wedding was a movie that had absolutely no studio backing. It was an indie. It grew. It was a grassroots movie success. $5 million budget funded by Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson because they saw Nia's play. And it made $368 million. Ironically, I think that my Big Fat Greek Wedding is funding all of Tom, Tom Hanks' war movies. Um, next. Something's got to give. We were just talking about that. Something's got to give is a female written and female directed movie, Nancy Myers. It had a budget of 60 to $80 million. That movie, 60 to $80 million, that does not exist now. Those movies get made under 20. That price point of two stars in a Hollywood movie just doesn't happen anymore, the way the, the economics have shifted in Hollywood. But this was also a movie with older people. And then they were like, oh, people will go see a movie with older people. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Everything in Hollywood, it's like they don't have live yesterday. It's like Groundhog Day, every day out there. It's like, oh my god, yesterday didn't happen. Oh, I wake up, oh my god. <laughs> Devil Wears Prada is important because, firstly, it birthed the Meryl Streep summer movie success, um, where she's you know, gone on to it, and we'll see the rest of this. And it also was a movie that brought men and women in because it was about business. So then they said, oh, men will go see a movie about women. But then they forgot very fast. And also, it wasn't, <laughs> and also that was the time, 2006, it wasn't only about having just huge opening weekend dollars. Movies about women have a much longer tail because as you know, lots of women and men in here, but women don't rush out overnight. We don't have to go see the movie first thing. We want to hear our six friends telling us that's a good movie to see before we're going to spend our time or our money on it. Um, next, Sex and the City. That kind of changed the dynamic a little because women went in groups to see movie. And, and they left the guys home and nobody cared and it made a fortune. 
the thing to understand about movies like this is movies where women go in groups can be huge box office successes. Any of those man movies, Iceman, not Iceman, Iron Man, and Batman and all of them, they can't be a success if women don't go. Next. And the things also to see is how the farm gross has grown in the last decade. So Mamma Mia, if you've seen these movies, please just you know say, hey, yeah, so I can know I'm not crazy here. Mamma Mia, everyone in the world has seen, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, who's it now? <laughs> 27 million, again, another Meryl Streep summer success. And look at the foreign gross. Ha and this movie's got half a billion dollars behind it. If it was a movie about men, it would have seven sequels by now. <laughs> but because it was a movie, now Pierce, Pierce Brosnan can never sing on, on screen again. It should be like an outlaw. But, you know, Meryl Streep continues to sing. She's got a decent voice. And as you all know, so it's a really kind of female-centric project that, you know, doesn't have a lot of sequelitis attached to it. And that's with a lot of women, it's like these one-off things. But we have to be able to think outside the box and create more stories. Like, why can't we come up with a second Mama Mia story? I think people would go to it. Next. Twilight. <laughs> this is where I talk to my girls. So, I'm not talking about the content in Twilight. Uh, we all have issues with Bella and her, you know, she has, we all, Bella, right? Whatever. She was a little complacent at the beginning of these movies. But the importance of Twilight is because everything the success is now is based on the fact that this movie did well, and this was the only Twilight movie that was directed by a woman. So it is set the foundation for all the successes we're seeing now, and Catherine Hardwick, who had a budget of $37 million, and remember when the first Twilight came out, all I do is complain about the sparkly vampires, right? Oh my god, all we do is see the sparkles on their faces. And the vitriol that was attached to Twilight is never attached to movies that have male, male stars. Catherine Hardwick wants to direct the second movie. Who wouldn't? She said, I want more money, and I need more time, and they said no. Then they hired a man, gave him more money, and gave him more time. All the Twilights are written by Melissa Rosenberg. Next. So I'm just going to go quickly through and understanding the huge opening weekends. Because these are the properties that Hollywood wants. They have built-in audiences. And this is how you draw huge opening weekends. Next. Eclipse. Next. And then Breaking Dawn. Now look at the increase of the foreign grosses of this. And look how the increases of the budgets have happened. In all, this is all in the you know, five years that Twilight took to get to the thing. And let's go to the last one, Breaking Dawn Part Two. $829 million. So the foreign gross doubled the domestic gross. Now this girl's a big star now, Mackenzie Foy. Um, and again, the budgets kept grow up getting higher because people would invest more. Next. And then Bridesmaids. So Bridesmaids was a one-off because everyone was like, oh my god, women are funny, right? And then, I mean, we all know women are funny, right? But it's just like all of a sudden Hollywood's like, oh my god, let's make the next Bridesmaids. I, I'm sorry, have you seen the next Bridesmaids? Because it hasn't been made. So no offense, you know, Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumble, they want to do other things, that's cool. But like, come on. There are so many funny people out there. Um, but this is a month look at how big the domestic gross is compared to the foreign gross. And that's, they talk about how comedies don't translate overseas. Um, so we gotta figure that out, especially related to women. Next, Brave, really important movie. First movie co-directed by a woman out of Pixar. First female protagonist out of Pixar in all their histories. How many Cars movies have there been? <laughs> I mean, these are the things that we don't think about in our everyday lives because we just go, oh, this movie's opening, I want to see it. But you need to understand how little women are seen at the grandest scale in the Hollywood stuff. Um, next, Hunger Games, which I can't believe I forgot the name of that. <laughs> it came out of the gate huge, $152 million. The difference between Hunger Games and the Twilight stuff is a lot of boys went to see Hunger Games. And it continues to have, draw a male and female kind of equivalent audience. Next. And Catching Fire, the first female protagonist movie to be number one at the box office in 40 years. 40. 40. The last one was The Exorcist. 40 years, people. Next. 
And then Mockingjay Part 1 this past year is number two at the box office. Do we know what number one at the box office last year was? Anybody? Anybody who wasn't at lunch with me? What? There you go, American Sniper. Number one movie in the United States last year. Next. Frozen. Frozen was like, oh my god, we can make a movie with two female protagonists. That's not a love story per se, and it will make boatloads of money and kids will not stop singing that song for decades. <laughs> Fifth highest grossing movie ever. And of course they're making a sequel. I'd be idiots not to. Um, next, Divergent. There would be no Divergent had there no, been no Hunger Games, had there been no Twilight. If anybody says different, they can you know fight with me, whatever. Um, none of these movies are directed by women. Next, Maleficent, important movie, written by Linda Wolverton, Angelina Jolie's highest grossing movie, propelled her to a whole other level as an actor, but also she used that in her directorial and everything like that. I mean, I, I think she's perfect. I don't know how she gets through the day. Um, <laughs> but look at the farm gross on that, right? Huge. And it didn't have the biggest opening weekend, $69 million. And that's a summer opening weekend, but it's really good. Her highest opening weekend, I do believe, higher than any movie that Brad Pitt has opened in. Um, next. Fold in Our Stars. So important because that's a movie that we made for $12 million. And the way that this became a success was John Green and Girls on YouTube. That's it. Okay, next. Lucy, men went to see this. I did not like this. Male perspective on, girl, on violence with women. Important to understand, $405 million. Next. Fifty Shades of Grey, another issue with content. Highest opening weekend of a female director. Budget $40 million, even though everyone had read that book still will not invest more money in movies about women. Next. Top 14, uh, 2014 movies, as I said last year, we got women in Hunger Games, we got women in Maleficent, we got women in Gone Girl, we got women in Divergent. There, That's it. There is one, there is a different woman in uh, Birdie and Elf. She's not the central focus of that story. Yes, Next. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Okay, so let's talk about this summer. Avengers, Ant-Man, Fantastic Four. These are $100 million movies. Next. Other big movies coming out this summer. Next. Female-centric that I think will be over $100 million one. And it's animated. Next. And these are the high-profile movies, movies that I believe will open on 3,000 screens that have female um, protagonists. You got Hot Pursuit. No comment. Spy. And then the one I'm looking forward to. Pitch Perfect 2. Next. And you got another Meryl Streep movie this summer written by Diablo Cody. And then here are some um, other movies that I hope that you will look for. Next. Next. And then uh, again, you have uh, Jennifer Lawrence uh, in this. This is Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. This is going to be awesome. Women getting to vote. It's coming from England. And then of course, Maki J is going to hopefully them all the way. Next. Uh, two more releases that are uh, written and directed by women but don't have female protagonists. Next. Power of Women as a Market. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. We buy everything. Can you keep going? <laughs> as Kate Blanchett said at the Oscars two years ago, we're not in each audience. We are the majority. Next. And here is the data. 80% of all consumer decisions are made by women. Next will control two-thirds of the wealth. This is not made up, people. This is true. Everybody knows it. The only people who don't haven't figured out how to deal with women are movie people. Car people know that women buy everything. TV people who sell TVs know that women buy everything. Next. Power of women. Okay, that was, that was close. Power of women to open films, and then I guess I will close. Here you go. Twilight, again, 75% of the opening weekend of Twilight were women. Fifty Shades of Grey, 68% female, and the Fall Four Stars is 82% female. There's all you girls right here. Next. All right, so I think I probably should cut it off. All right, so here's what I'm going to say. If you are interested in this issue related to women in Hollywood, you need to read my blog. 
not to toot my horn, but to say that it's important for you to be a participant and understand where you're spending your money because your power, your, your money is your vote. And you can vote for women or you cannot vote for women. I will go see The Age of Ultron. I have no problem seeing those kinds of movies, but I want other movies because I believe our stories matter and our stories count just as much as male stories and they should not be defining our times. I look at movies as arcade paintings. If our stories are not there, it's like we, never, we weren't here. So I'm gonna leave it at that and we're gonna have our discussion now and we can talk more afterwards. Thank you all so much. Hollywood. It's on IndieWire. I can give you all the websites on the first slide. The address is on the website and I'm happy to share it with you. We have a weekly email of all the movies that are opening that are women directed and women centric that you can all sign up for. I do all the work for you. Actually, my interns do all the work. <laughs> I just supervise now. Um, but we want you, we want to empower you with the information because that's how important this is. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to go down there and introduce our panelists now to react. We can react to what we just learned here and we can talk a little bit about it. But what we're focusing on in this panel is understanding where we've been and where we are now. But the conversation has to be about where we're going and what we actually can do as filmmakers and film viewers to move this forward. And there are ways that we can make systemic change. Our panel is incredible. They are from all different um, places in the filmmaking industry. And I have to go over there so I can read their intros so I get it right. So hold on. Okay, walking. All right. So um, let's start with Tessa Blake. She is a, well, you know what, it, it goes without saying that these are all award-winning filmmakers. There's Peabody's in here, there's Emmys in here, there's McKnight Fellows, there's Directing Workshop for Women Fellows, there's, you know, so I'm, I'm not even gonna, as much as they would like to hear it, or you the list. <laughs> so we have Tessa Blake, you can come in as I introduce you, who is, um, Walking through. Walking through. I know, we didn't mean to do it this way, but see, you're getting, you're getting your recognition. <laughs> she comes from um, a long career of documentary filmmaking, South by Southwest, honored by the Academy, Showtime, PBS, I mean, you know, really wonderful. And is also a writer for television and is a alumni of the Directing Workshop for Women, which I hope we can talk about. It's been in place since 1974. Did I miss anything? No. Okay. Elizabeth Manischel, who is a um, first time filmmaker, and her film is screening today at 4. 40. 40. Bread and butter. It's great. Bread and butter. Yes. So um, she is also an MFA of USC and is a film critic. Are you still doing that, or is that something? No, I quit. You quit. Okay. <laughs> to go into the profitable world of independent filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, we have Lorenz Grant. Um, she's come here from New York. She is a award-winning filmmaker as well. She has done a lot of work on, um, on what, how, what do you want to call it, issue-related documentaries. And she is a producer of the Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution, which is also screening today and tomorrow. So thank you for joining us. And finally, who did I leave out? Laura. So I was okay, Laura. Laura Shapiro is a um, local filmmaker, Minnesotan, um, comes from a legal background, so we have issues with that, but she's doing, she's got a film in the festival today, Miss Tibet, Exile and Beauty, beautiful film, sold on three screens, and um, she has a lot to talk about in terms of what it's like to come into this career late. So Tessa, Elizabeth, Lorenz, Melissa, finally have a seat with us and we are going to try and figure out how we can start to change things now okay thank you so 
it's so very cozy in here. I'd love to have a panel discussion, but it seems to me we might want to try with questions. Do you guys feel like that's okay? Or do you want to, I can ask the first one and we'll go from there. Um, we're talking about solutions. We're talking about um, how we can, besides spending money, how we as women filmmakers can move not only our own careers forward, but the careers of those who are coming into it. Because anybody knows who's been at this a while, if you're gonna try to make a career out of filmmaking, it's a really bad idea. Um, there's very little money to be made in the, in the, in the real work-a-day filmmakers. You're either spending your own money, or your friend's money, or your parents' money, or no money, and asking for so many favors that eventually you're not gonna have any friends or family left. <laughs> so um, I would love to ask you, let's start with you, Tessa, because I think this is really important. We talked about ways um, that women can do this, and um, I hate to start with someone who's not here, but there's an esteemed director in, in the world today, her name's Leslie Linkagotter, who couldn't make it because she's shooting Homeland. Um, but why don't you tell me about her and how she's moved forward and how that's helping um, you? Sure. Um, so Leslie was a choreographer, um, and she uh, came a really interesting way to being a filmmaker and, and now a television director and a producing director for television. But she, um, she came through the American Film Institute's Directing Workshop for Women, which I've come through as well as Beth, actually. And so this is a program that was started 40 years ago. We will know we've hit success when we can dissolve this program. It's kind of a travesty, but it's been in place for 40 years, and we still are where we are. Um, Leslie made an Academy Award winning short film and then she um, started directing for television. And she had directs volumes and volumes of television. The, the thing I think Beth is referring to is that now she is what's called a producing director. So in television, we have showrunners who are the head writing staff and the head sort of producer of the vision of television. We also, in many shows, but not all shows, have something called a producing director, and that's the person who is primarily hiring the directors and keeping the look, the visual life, the directing life of the television show consistent. Leslie is the producing director for Homeland, so quietly, Leslie has launched this renegade campaign, and last season, I think there was one white man who directed Homeland. But it was sneaky, like she didn't tell anyone. Um, and no one noticed. Um, and like that show's really good this season. But, um, um, so nothing went off the rails, crazy. Um, and I think, you know, one of my goals is to, well, I'm, I'm moving into directing television, which is uh, weirdly, incredibly hard to break into, as I was saying to some friends over lunch. Like, one hand, you'll hear people like completely denouncing television directors and say, like, ah, they're like glorified traffic cops. It's a writer's medium. And then I go to them and I'm like, but I think a great glorified traffic cop, right? And it's like, I mean, I can do that, right? You can trust me with that. Um, and then on the other hand, like, there's just no breaking in at all, right? And the numbers for women, are slightly better on the directing side in television, but 10%. Um, so we hold up 10% of the world. If you read Half the Sky, you know what I'm referencing. We need to hold up half the 10% of the sky in television. Anyway, I'd like to not just be a television director, I'd like to be a producing director for television so I can quietly lead my own revolution and try to employ, over time, more women in the field. No. Yeah, it's really important to note that um, it's a long road, but she is now in a position to influence, and she's influencing our lives. So, do you have anything to say about how you got here, Lawrence? Um, I, too, did not follow uh, a traditional path. I mean, maybe that's some of the takeaway. I did not study film. Um, <laughs> I studied journalism. I was a journalism and French major, and then sort of left the country, was a foreign correspondent in Latin America for a little while then came back to the States and sort of the documentary world exploded. And interestingly, I got hired because a, a male director didn't really like using the telephone or talking to people and asked if that was something I could do. <laughs> and I said, well, as a journalist, I guess that's all I've done. And I to call people and get interviews and chase people down from presidents to student leaders to bankers, etc. So that was completely, you know, I could do that in my sleep. And so that was really 
how I got in. I mean, you could also almost say I got in because I could quote unquote work the phones. Um, but I, you know, kind of now looking at this whole lexicon, it is fascinating because to me, like what, you know, that path, I don't know if it exists for us, like for women to be directors suddenly, but we're too, we don't want to talk to people or we can't do this or we, you know, we're, you know, it just doesn't really work that way. Like we have to be very sort of outspoken and involved in so many different aspects to kind of get that chance. Um, so, you know, that was sort of how I got involved in that explosion of the cable documentary world. And it so happened I got on these big historical projects because they were just very dense. Somehow I'm always dealing with the FBI. <laughs> I guess nobody else wants to call them or deal with them. So I have, you know, dealt with every sort of huge, intimidating uh, institution and um, try and get them into films. Uh, so that was really my, I guess, my gateway. And, you know, in terms of the survival aspect, you know, a lot of my, I guess I would say male colleagues, and many of them are, are directing commercials or TV shows. I mean, I don't, I don't know any women directly who are able to sort of do that and sustain themselves, whether directing the Mazda commercial or, you know, whatever car or whatever soft drink. Um, you know, they, all of them just seem to be very, very, um, incredibly complex and difficult worlds to crack. Um, but I guess that's why we're here to figure out how we can do that. And clearly we are doing it because we're sitting here, but it's just, you know, there isn't any rest, really. You just, are, you know, each project kind of can lead you to the next, but it's not like it comes easily. It's not like your phone, my phone is ringing off the hook. You know, you get, even if you get up there, you get the Emmy, you still gotta call people. I mean, it's just, not, um, there isn't a place where you can kind of go and rest and sort of coast, like, yeah, I made it now, awesome, and I can like bring in the masses. It's still, you're still fighting for yourself to stay in the game, and then whatever you can do, be it an intern, be it any person, to try and either bring along and, and so more people can be in that, in the industry. I mean, we've all heard the term old boys network, right? I mean, that's how they break in, and so we need to use our power, and when women, have enough power and feel comfortable and confident enough to put forward women. And it's not only about mentoring, even though mentoring is so vital, it's also about sponsoring. And sponsoring is very different than mentoring. Sponsoring is basically saying, I vouch for this person. Women are kind of afraid to do that because they feel that it's gonna, gonna bounce back on them if it doesn't work out right. But guys, I mean, they're like, hey, Joe, this kid's my, Joe's my friend, my kid, you know, my friend's son, and he's a really good kid, give him a shot. They have no problem doing that, and we hear that all the time. And I think women really need to feel comfortable and confident in their power that they can do that on a regular basis and, you know, create a network as, so that women can move up the pipeline. I just directed a film with, um, you guys might know, Amy Landecker from Transparent. Has anyone seen Transparent? That's a really interesting piece because that's sort of this breakthrough auteur television and it's Jill Soloway's vision as a writer-director. Amy Landecker plays the eldest sister. Um, she's in my film that I just shot and I am proud to say that all the creative key positions were women. We have a female cinematographer, we have a female editor, we have a female production director. <laughs> Partially that was about consciousness, but also they are unbelievably good. These are all like stunningly brilliant women at their jobs, um, but consciousness is part of that too. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. Ah, there's one. Hi, I wanted to know um, um, what, I was just reading that um, Manola Darbo, um, Manola Darbo's um, article in the New York Times came out in January about the state of women in film and just how fucking dismal it is, pardon me in French, but um, she mentioned game changer films in the article, and I'm just wondering what kind of an impact you think that would have, uh, what kind of impact do you think that um, organizations like that have in practicing checkbook activism you know, to really fund women in film, because it's, you know, like you said, it's not just about mentoring, but it's about giving women the money to do the projects to really see it through. I can speak to that. Um, game, they're wondering if Game Changer Films has any impact on what we're doing here. Game Changer was invited to be here today and they couldn't because they were at Tribeca. They don't care about that. But um, Minneapolis is cooler. Minneapolis is cooler. 
They are a um, financing, what is it? They provide equity financing to narrative features directed by women. They have two that are done at the moment that are at Tribeca, Jamie Babbitt's, and then I can't remember the other, yeah, Fresno. And uh, so yes, they are set up completely to finance. Do you guys have any experience with them? I mean, I think Game Changer is awesome, but they're very low budget. And so we need to have higher budget places. There are a lot of a lot of producer producerial entities looking for female content now. And the key is money. And the key is for make the people who have the money understand that if, if you have a female director and if you have female content or one or the other, that you can be successful. It's all about pitching the box office to these people with money access. So I'd like to hear a little bit about this. This is, well, we don't want this to devolve into why are we here, but um, I would like to address the financial part of it. If anybody wants to talk about how they finance their film, what, um, what they came, what, what struggles or challenges or successes they had, because you'll constantly hear from people when you talk about the underrepresentation of women in Hollywood, they'll say, well, they're studio heads. There are big producers, they have all the money. Why, you know, why are you complaining you don't get the money? Well, it's just something very different about being in that position and being the person responsible for delivering the creative, so. Can you also get more specific about not just um, how you finance your film, but how you finance your life? Yeah. Well, that, that's, yes, we can move it, and, and the challenges of, of just being a woman, so here. <laughs> okay, so this. Um, to speak a little bit about Game Changer, we tried to do Game Changer. I made a really low budget film. I can't, I'm not allowed to say the budget. Like I've always wanted to talk about it, but my producers have like sworn me the secrecy. It's under 250, so if that gives you an idea, I'll tell you it's a lot under 250, because I, I can say that. <laughs> so um, we were actually not large enough for Game Changer. So that's also a scenario that you run into. I'm a low budget filmmaker, and I've always wanted to be a low budget filmmaker. And you don't, you just have to anticipate not making any money <laughs> being a low budget filmmaker. And in terms of organizing the finances, we did, a, we did a Kickstarter campaign. Something that you should do in a Kickstarter campaign, which we didn't do, is allocate living funds for yourself and your, for your producers. We didn't do that. I fund everything outside of the Kickstarter campaign. Um, I'm still paying for E&O. I work three jobs to pay for my E&O insurance, you know? What's but, e &O? Uh, errors and emissions insurance. That's your legal insurance. Yeah. And you never think about it when you're making a movie, but you start thinking about it. Um, but no, it's, it's horrible. But at the same time, I love that every dollar that I make goes to my art. And even if I know I'm not gonna make any money, which is the truth with the movies that I make, I really enjoy the idea that I'm that it's happening and that um, it's all going to what I want to do with my life. So it involves a lot of sacrifice for a lot of individuals, I think. Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, I am local. Um, I don't really know anything. I'm completely on the outside of Hollywood um, and and the business part of it. But in terms of, of doing it in this financial question, so. First, for the, the budget of my film, um, it was a real hodgepodge of self-financed credit cards, that whole thing, um, crowdsourcing, a, a very discreet, specific stage and piece of the process. A film made over many, many years, that's part of it. It took many years, both because of the content, but also because of the finances and reality. Um, and then I was very fortunate um, to get a lot of uh, foundation funding and grant funding. That's a lot of work. I mean, that is a, that's a whole career and an art in and of itself, and, and developing the skills. Maybe my legal background is helpful in terms of my um, capacity for writing and um, sort of, you know, the way you have to prepare legal arguments, et cetera. But none of it's come easy. Um, this is not my first feature film, it's my second. Um, and I mean, not to discourage anybody, but it's it's a fight every step of the way, and it's kind of banging your head against the wall. And then you come back to it. I love doing it. The other thing I'll just throw in um, is that in in my film that's screening tonight, it's the um, Minnesota premiere. I very consciously have chosen to collaborate with women too. My creative partner, who's here in the other room, Kelly Nathy. I couldn't do this without her. So I mean, that's that is hugely instrumental is finding your um, who you work with and who you work with over time and who you trust and who you collaborate well with. Um, and I very consciously 
brought women in every step of the way. I had female editors, I've had female assistants, female interns. It's not that I only will work with women. I had a magnificently talented uh, composer who's from the Twin Cities, Tom Scott. So it's not that I won't work with men. But um, I love working with women. On it's, it's a story about women. That's my choice. I won't only work on women's stories, but it's really important. And as far as what you guys can do, you know, I don't have the answers for Hollywood or, or changing that um, that paradigm. But if you see a film, especially an indie, low budget film that you guys like, get behind it and be part of the buzz, be part of the social networking. Because people pay attention, distributors pay attention, everybody pays attention to that stuff. So that's a way you individually can have a role. I am, um, first of all, I'm very fond of men, I'm married to one, but um, <laughs> you guys are a little crazy, but the rest of them are fine. Um, uh, so uh, crowdfunding, we sort of touched on a little bit, and Melissa described how we want to feel like indies are way better for women than studio films, but statistically they're sort of depressingly not. But what is interesting is that um, both in our industry and in the startup industry, there's a pretty striking statistic, which is that women get, well, I'll back it out. Sundance did an interesting study of the first time female filmmakers versus first time male filmmakers that they saw come through Sundance, and how long it took those filmmakers to get their second film off the ground. And the average for the male filmmakers was two to three years, and the average for the female filmmakers was seven to eight years. So anecdotally, I can tell you what I've seen happen over and over again, which is that we lose financing. We come up to bat, we lose financing. Financing falls through. It keeps falling through over and over again. Cindy Shupak is a dear friend of mine who is the showrunner of Sex on the City, and she has had a film that, that has had financing and collapsed on financing now three or four times, right, the same film. Um, but in the VC world and in our world, um, in the VC world, women, and this is one of the arguments to change the crowdfunding rules at the higher level. We're aware of crowdfunding on the Kickstarter and Indiegogo level, but there's also this sort of level at which you can become an investor as an independent investor. And uh, while those protections were in place after the depression, there's some argument to sort of open this up now and let people take their own responsibility for their money because there's a huge feminist argument here. Uh, women overwhelmingly do not receive VC funding, do not. It's something like two to four percent of women who go up to bat at startup funding don't get it. But at, at the level of crowdfunding, women do much, much better. Now I've asked around, I've asked some VC friends, like why is this true? And it's partially like they don't believe women will take it seriously enough. The VC funding, they're trying to look for companies that go 10x, you know, 10 times their start value, right? Um, I think that's similar in film, and I'll say like I've dealt with the Warner Brother executives who are the lowest of numbers up there, and um, you know they believe their brand identity is that they do huge big movies, right? And they say to me over and over again like women don't want to do those movies. We can't find the women to do those movies. Those women don't exist. Um, this is a lie. Um, but I will say one thing that I kind of open up to my panelists with, which is that I had to check myself on something. So. I also work as a writer, my husband and I are a writing team, and we have a big budget paranoid political thriller feature. And it's going on the market pretty soon. And the woman who runs the directing workshop for women said to me, wait, I'm confused, you don't want to direct this? And I said, well, it's not that I don't want to direct it, I just don't want to burden the project, I need to make money, right? Like, I, I don't want to burden the project with me being attached as director, right? She pulls up that week's um, news, right, the aggregate news, and shows that some guy who's never shot one frame of film is now the director of the some big budget thing, right? And then some producer guy who's never shot one frame of film is the director of some big budget thing. And, um, and I <laughs> felt like I, I had self-selected to some extent, because there's a financial obligation, and this is part of the question of how do you do your life, right, because we've got to make money somewhere, because filmmaking is a hobby, not a job. And so uh, we can make money as writers, pretty reliably. But also I had, I felt, I had the indoctrinated experience that there was so little room at the table 
that I needed to go to try to get my room at the table on the things I felt like I could, the scrappy personal projects, the smaller things, the things I could probably get investor money for, the tinier budget things. And that is not, um, that's not me walking into Warner Brothers saying, take that. Here's a great script you want to buy, and you, in order to buy it, you have to have me attached to direct. <laughs> so, and I don't know. P.S. There's no end to the story. I don't know what I'm going to do because I got to make that money. So, it's a, and I and I'm a married mom. Like, there's a reality to my life, right? So, but it was internal. I'm I'm a big fat loud feminist. Like I think you know, and I just didn't hear how I was limiting myself there. Well, that's really interesting too, and I think. Um, I, Part of the, the issue is that we, we undersell. We talked about the confidence gap. There's 20% overconfidence in men and 20% underconfidence in women. And that you went in saying, oh, I don't want to burden this project, is, is part of the problem. I'm sorry to say, I invited you here. Um, <laughs> but I mean, but it's cultural and it's systemic. And it's just a part of a much broader problem than filmmaking. Um, that we can or cannot get, you know, don't have to get into. But um, that's, that's why we're trying to figure out what, what we can do to support each other so that when we walk onto a set, people will say, oh, there's the director. Not, oh, you know, are you here to drop off the director? Or, you know, are you the producer? I've been on sets lately where, well, I had one recently where a model walked in and she completely ignored me until I started acting like the director. And it's not that I was mad that she was ignoring me. I was upset that she never would think I would be in charge. And that's our problem. So the mentoring thing is very important um, part of this. But it's also back to like when we're one year old and we get handed our Barbie dolls and the boys get handed a ball. I mean, it's, it's socialized into us. So it's not necessarily, and I you know, spoke with someone literally this week who had the same story, and I actually told her, take her name off. I said, do you want to make your movie, or do you want it to be about you directing your movie? And, I, and that's like a shitty thing to say. And you're like, I can imagine what you're going through, but the hard, the hard thing is to get people out of their preconceived stereotypes. And I think that's what we have to do. And how women directors present themselves. It's like, it's the story, you know, Barbara Streisand, when she, she talks about being bossy and the other word, the bitch word. I mean, this is, you have to be confident. A woman is confident, she's a bitch. A guy is confident, he's the director. I mean, these are the things that get layered on women, and women in power, up to high the person running for president now. I mean, this is not any different than what goes on in politics and in any other industry in tech world, which is awful for women. We saw that sexual harassment lawsuit, things like that. So we have to you know, unburden ourselves, but you're also pitching to, to a room that's pretty much dudes, maybe a girl who could you know, have, you know, everybody has, nobody has green lighting power, everybody has red light power, right? Isn't that the, like, the, the rule? Like everybody can say no, no one can say yes. You gotta get enough people to say yes before, you know, as you go up. It's really, you know, it's a catch-22, and I feel for you so deeply. And women's reputations are very, very fragile. So this is something I've, I've, sat, I've been shadowing on a lot of TV shows to direct on them, and I was shadowing behind a producing director who they had somebody drop out on a slot, and he was putting some names forward, and he had several women on his list, and I was quietly and secretly on the conference call where, to a number, all the women by, by the way, he was on a conference call with all women, I will say that, and to a number, all the women's names fell off till they got to a guy's name. And it fell off in two different ways. Ah, I don't know, she's kind of tough. Or, I don't know, I mean, she's too, she's a little, she's kind of indecisive. Well, crazy is the tough. So it's tough, bitchy, <laughs> crazy. Like that's one way. Or if you're a woman who who likes to sort of build consent, you're indecisive, right? So women's reputations are very fragile, and it's one of the things we have to do for each other is to protect reputations. And I think Melissa's point of sponsoring is a very good one. That you just go to bat and you put women's names forward. And I. I think one of the things I'd like to say too is like, um, I as a younger woman just didn't see things this way and it took me a long time into my professional life to stop taking things personally and recognize that they were systemic and that I was, I was acculturated, sec 
in a sexist environment, I was talking to people, men and women, who were acculturated in a sexist environment. I thought there were places I wasn't welcome. If I had only known I wasn't welcome as a woman, I would have like totally gone to bat. You know, I don't. I mean, I don't. I'm happy to fight an institutional harm. Personally, I can get freaked out, right? Um, and I, for the younger women here, I would say like, do not take anything personally. Just assume that it's about sexism and fight hard. <laughs> Documentary, maybe PBS landscape, where it's you know grant funder station relation driven, and um, and you know certainly a lot. One thing that I really have noticed is you know looking at those statistics in the documentary world. Sure, there's lots of women, but the dirty secret is you know more women are you know sort of in the producer track. You know, I didn't know it was sort of being funneled into a track. I just thought, oh, okay, great. I need to just work hard work my way up and then you know I'll get a show I'll be directing soon they'll see how I'm tenacious but you know then you start looking around at your colleagues you know on my way up I just remember that was sort of a kind of a joke that um, before you could quote unquote get your producer or earn your producer title there were so many of my female colleagues who were stuck in the quote unquote co-producer ghetto I mean we just called it that you know show after show after big show after big show and I certainly didn't know of any raw female. I mean, this is you know more anecdotal than statistical, but it was just really fascinating how we just had that, how the, the needle just always seemed to move. Like, well, if you just did this, you know, then maybe, you know, then maybe you could reproduce on the next one. You know, maybe on the next one. And when you look, I mean, that's real time that's clicking and, you know, top, you know, ticking away. And then in terms of the funding situation, you know, I guess I looked at it as, being in production was also gonna be my day job. Since I didn't study film, I also felt, uh, and maybe that was at self-policing, like if I'm like, gonna learn more, I gotta know more, I didn't come out with a film degree, so um, I worked on other shows. I was a, I'm a you know, hired hand, I produced other shows. So that was the day job, but it also, on the flip side, it's just so all-encompassing. These, this documentary work because it's so involved, the budgets and the margins are so small, and you just you have to give up 150 percent of your own life to get this somebody really somebody else's dream completed. So, but when you try and make the positive out of that, you have an amazing experience, you develop relationships, and when you are going to do, if you want to direct your own film, then you now know probably a dynamite roster of crew, cinematographers, you know, sound, you know, editors, et cetera, et cetera, that now you can call upon. So you can kind of, you know, marshal your resources to figure out, okay, how do I just eat, but then how do I then come to the table with an actual project? And I kind of felt like since I was in that PBS sort of world, that I needed and I wanted to make my mark as a director, and so that was a big fight, and then I fought to direct the Jesse Owen documentary, and that was historical, and it was a male subject, yeah. you know, yeah. it just went on and on, and then finally it was like, yes, you know, I just this tussle, and then, you know, then I looked at the budget, and I was like, so how am I even gonna just clear the licensing costs? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was like, okay, I just gotta make it happen. So I had literally, I think, 18 unpaid interns. I had part-time researchers, part-time this, part-time that, and then they're like, oh, by the way, good luck with the Olympics. <laughs> you know, I hear they, you know, charge billions. And I was like, okay, and then I was like, okay, it's on. It's, this is it, you know, I gotta bring it to the mat, I can't sit around in line, let's just go. And a few times I would just call, I would row a little bit and then came back, and then I got everything cleared. Um, because, you know, I think I have to bring the show. I have to deliver, and that is one thing that we have to do. As women, it's just, you know, you think, oh, I should have to think about these things. You know, it's just production, you know, male or female. You still have to, you know, deliver, and you shoot a shot, and it's still the same. But really, all of these intricacies, the relationships, the feedback you're getting with the network, the relationship you have with the crew, the scripting, like the entire process is just extra layers and extra stuff that you have to, I mean, it's a minefield, but being in this industry is already a minefield full of enormous egos regardless. So it's almost like start there. I mean, this isn't, you know, the Pleasant Patty or whatever you want to call it show. I mean, this is a industry with ginormous egos, ginormous talent, ginormous stakes because everybody's got something on the line. You know, there is money at stake. Who's gonna lose this money? 
So, you know, if you're gonna play in that field, that's the world you're playing in. So that's, I guess, how I would say that. Just because, you know, things are changing now. You can pick up a camera, you can make a movie. Just because you can make a movie doesn't mean you should make a movie. <laughs> this is a very tough industry for women and for men. If you don't have a vision and you don't have that, don't do it. I mean, just don't. But there are people who have it, you know, in the gut, the fire, right? You've got to have that fire. But you're going to fight for that fire every day to tell your story. And I just keep telling people that. It's like, this is not going to be easy. I just want to offer a different perspective because I was in the audience, obviously we were all in the audience and watching the video and I was getting teary eyed and I was getting you know, really excited about Melissa's presentation. But personally, I've never experienced sexism. I've never been discriminated against as a woman. I've never walked onto a set. In fact, most people thought I was the director when I wasn't the director. Um, so this is just an alternate. That doesn't mean that this is the case. I mean, I'm very, I mean, these are like astounding women on the panel with me. I still think I should be over there and I really don't know why I'm here. So like I'm confused why I have a microphone in my hand. Um, but like I'm very green. I made one film, but during that entire time I was respected. There was a hierarchy that everyone deferred to. And um, you know, it can be done and it can be done in, in, in an unpainful way. I think a lot of it comes from if you control the money which we did, um, and that's why I do advise low budget, but then you have a much smaller reach. But I just want to encourage women filmmaker, filmmakers to make their own content and control their funds and control you know, all aspects of production. I cast the film, I directed, um, I wrote. We also had every key crew member was a woman except for our editor and our scripty. Just happens that way. Because that's a gender Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it can be done, and it, it can be you know, an exciting landscape for you in addition to some of these um, really difficult scenarios that you may traverse. Yes, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you explained the film in college, and I was wondering if you have any um, advice for the next generation or upcoming I, one of the things to, to piggyback off of what uh, Liz said is that I think actually my experience was that in school, and I, I sort of cobbled together some film school and then did the AFI program later, but in school I found that there were no gender issues. And in fact, this was part of like only a retrospective recognition of where I had hit up against sexism because you know, I graduated top of my class in high school, in college, I did some graduate school. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't experience sexism at all through my education. And as I was saying to some friends over lunch, like, I sort of thought, like, thank you, women's movement, that was great. Now we're all equal. Awesome. Um, and uh, it was, it was then progressing further into my career, and then only later that I look back and thought, like, wow, there were a lot of things that I was up against that I wasn't recognizing as systemic. And there were a lot of things that people were saying to me that they weren't recognizing as systemic, including, and I will do the small anecdote, but I was talking to agents in the early part of my career after I had a feature documentary that was released theatrically and talking about moving into television, and they said, well, we've been working really hard to get this Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker named Barbara Koppel, who God love her, is like one of the best filmmakers on planet Earth. Uh, for 18 months, we've been trying to break her into television. It's fucking hard. And uh, we finally got her a break on some terrible procedural because there was like a documentary narrative. And I was like, great, okay, so I'm not welcome here. Thank you for your time. Anyway, the upshot of this is that I think film school can be great, or film undergrad can be great. Um, I think that the people I work with who come out of film school education have a tremendous professionalism that I really respect. Um, I think the trick is then to figure out how to keep moving past it because it's kind of idealized. You have some equipment, you have a lot of high-end crew, you got a lot of a good educational model out of it, and then you're confronted with how to make a living past that. And so my, a friend of mine said to me one time, and I thought this was really wise, don't be confused with being good at film school with being good at film. And by that, she didn't just mean aesthetically, she also meant the business of. And so whatever you're learning on the film school level, keep thinking ahead. Keep pushing your knowledge ahead and how to keep working the business and be not just smart, but savvy. And you have to get used to being, um, because for you it's not going to change that much. You have to get used to being around men all the time, of being the only woman in the room, 
being one of the few women on the set. And that is also, I mean, we, we're not really here for like reverse discrimination and shutting men out of everything, but there are different um, learning curves that women have. When you walk into, say, a television drama where they shift, they switch out directors all the time, a woman will take twice as long as a man to get to work. You have to first go through a lot of getting to know you, trust you, what's your process, I'm pissing on things and stuff like that to get to the work. So you just have to be prepared to deal in a aggressive environment and to do it well. Every woman on this panel sends um, Liz, but she's here for that reason because you, all, you do have a different perspective. Have been doing this a long time and it, they'll tell you it's hard. And um, so yeah, just be prepared to, to stand strong in the wind forever. <laughs> Till the end of time. And do be nimble. I mean, the advantage of being in an academic school environment is you can learn all the different aspects, you know, from editing, all the different aspects of storytelling, and you should. You know, don't be afraid of anything. Don't be afraid of the techie aspect. Don't be afraid of the scripting aspect. Like, jump in from scripting, the gaffing department, the camera department, the editing. You know, because in a way we have to be, um, you know, much more nimble just anyway to stay afloat in this industry. But I would pick of that what you enjoy, you know, what you think you can kind of hone in on, which craft you like to do. Um, you know, I'm, you know, working on an indie doc as well, and so I'm always, you know, I'm always shooting, you know, second unit and doing sound, and, um, and I think sound is not my strong suit since I gesticulate my hand, so I've learned that sound, I do it, but you know, I'm like, yes, I'm gonna, Great, 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 you know, I just bring my own self in. <laughs> but, um, but understand the gear, understand, you feel comfortable, like you can, because your command will just, when you walk on set, you understand who's doing what, and what they're doing, and why they're doing it, and what you are expecting out of them. You don't have to know every single program or software to the detail, but, you know, I know who's on my set. You know, there's an editor, there's a DIT person, what are they doing, what are they downloading, where are they downloading it, what am I expecting? And then what am I expecting at the end of my shoot day? It's not this confrontational argument. It's just everyone's on the same page. And then you just find yourself, you just have a much calmer and productive film and shooting experience because then everybody's clear on who's what, what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, and how they're supposed to do it. I think nobody you know, um, has the advantage of when it's just confusion and chaos on a set regardless of, you know, and I've been on, I've been on those sets both you know, male and female driven, certainly the women got more blowback, but basically everybody didn't enjoy it because it's confusing. So, um, so I would just say, you know, use that, the academia part as a tool that you can come out with so much more vocabulary and to do stuff. Um, because we're now in that age um, when, you know, and then you have to decide, do you want to do work for hire? I mean, I don't think I have the luxury to decide, oh, I'm not gonna do that because it's, you know, I have an old tour and I can't do anything for a corporation or for NGO or what have you. I mean, if you really wanna be in this business, it's a business and decide how you want to be in that business and how you want to um, survive in it. I'll just jump in and say, I think this goes for within film school and I, of course, at this sideways, they did that in film school. So whether you're doing this in film school or you're doing this another way, I would be really aggressive and assertive about finding mentors. Um, and find it, 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 this, this business is so much about relationships. Um, and that doesn't always overtly get talked about or in terms of film school, but it's so much is who you know and, and what your relationships are like um, and how you connect with people. And I mean, so for me, on the upside, I come from outside, and there are a lot of assets that I bring from coming from a, another system and another world, and skills that came with that, and a fearlessness, I think, that I bring from being a public defender before I came to this. So, worst case, you're going to say no to me. Like, someone's not going to jail. But um, the, the downside is I don't have that backlog of coming up through the ranks with people, both whether it's an academic setting or um, you know, when you're 20 something and you're working and you're working on other people's projects. So that's, that's something I would be really mindful about. Not just the academic or what school you go to or where your degree is from, but who you're working with and who, 
who you're learning under and who you're learning from. Can I just jump in with a question? Can I just jump in with a follow-up question to something that you said? So this may be a little provocative. Mention male or female? Male. Depends. Uh, it's it's who you talk with. Oh, what do you talk with? Well, I'll die. I got one you. Um, there are so few senior women in our profession, and that the backlog is immense. Uh, you know, Leslie and Glatter, who we referenced earlier, like would be the mentor to the world, and she, and, so, and Jill Soloway is like a godmother to us all. Like, these are incredibly dynamic, and there there are many many others, but there are so few of them, relatively, that I think it's much easier to access men. Honestly, I think there are fewer people kind of lined up behind them. There's, uh, if anyone read Lean In, she talks about the complexity of having a male mentor if you're a woman in terms of perception. So I think and to anyone who didn't read that, it's a question of like, when there's an older man and a younger woman, you know, first of all, we're just not having this sort of low key social time of drinks after work in the same kind of way necessarily. Um, that being said, I just think it's, uh, it, if it's something you're comfortable with, I think there's, there's much less kind of pressure on men to be useful to women than there are women to be useful to women. So it's really, for me, a practical question of bandwidth. The women who are ahead of me are remarkable and amazing and want me to work, but they also want like 55 of me to work. And I just have more access to men. It's just a bandwidth question. I'm gonna disagree a bit, because um, I think that at, at this level, you know, maybe it would be good to have a female to see a female in power. Maybe at your level, you need guides to get yourself up the next level. Um, but one of the things that I just want to say is um, just because you want to support women doesn't mean you're against men. And I feel that the high, I have all the time I go on these panels and it's just like, we're trying to be half the world. And we're, we're women are trying to figure out how to do this. And um, what happens in the guilds and stuff like that is that the guys are just like, we don't want, we don't want more women, you know? Th there are certain, like, job, amount jobs, you know, it's like the quota thing, you know? It's like, okay, we can have three girls here today. And so that's why we need to build a critical mass. We need to build critical mass of women in leadership in all industries. Directing and producing, this is not a unique problem, as I keep saying, critical mass. When you are in a room and 30% of the people, this is, you know, studies done by political science people, and 30% of the people are in the room, you can be yourself, you can answer questions, you can be present in a way that you can't be when you're the only girl in the room. And I think that's part of what we're struggling for, is to build this critical mass towards gender equity. Because I think all of our movies will be different, and then you'll have access to people in power at all levels. Um, yeah. And it's about privilege too. I mean, I feel like, um, you know, and these film schools and the education stuff, we have to really think about the, the room that we're in and the access that's here and, it, you know, what people can do for education. And not everybody can go to film school. And I know that young women are going into film school and they start out being wanting to be directors and slowly but surely something happens and they are now a producer and they're producing movies for men. So this is also about you know privilege and access and intersectionality. My young feminists, yeah. racing <laughs> intersectionality, and knowing that you don't just walk into the room as a woman, you walk in with so many other things attached to who you are and where you come from. Yeah, I'd like to just maybe piggyback a little bit on what everybody's saying and answer your question too. One, one area that I think is really important for women to have a better understanding, a better grasp of them than the men in the business is finance. Mm -hmm. Because you you walk into a room and the assumption is you don't get it. So you're fighting that. So even though, okay, you're a micro filmmaker, and so I don't need to know, I'm not saying this to you, I don't need to know what VC, what a VC is, I don't get need to get those guys, I don't know, have to know the financing package and how equity financing works. False. If you want to work in the business at any level, you better understand finance better than the boys in the room because they're gonna assume you don't know anything. And, and that's how you need to have, we need to get the checkbook, as we were saying. And the only way we're gonna get the checkbook is getting, get, getting the money and then getting the money. 
You see, in, uh, in theater in New York, there are a lot of, there's sort of an indie theater world, and there are a lot of female directors in the indie theater world. It's a really healthy representation. And then as you get to off-Broadway, it drops dramatically. It drops to about 30% are female directors. And by the time you get to Broadway, they're like two. You know, so there's just budgets. There's just a place at which there's a huge budget fall off. You know, if it's an expensive television show, it's less likely that a woman will direct it. You know, there are more women directing CW shows, which are relatively cheap, MTV shows, which are relatively cheap, and very few directing CBS shows, which are relatively expensive, right? And it's also slots at film festivals. Like, women will be in the competition at film festivals, and then it becomes a special presentation, less women. A gala, less women. But this is the business. The more money that's in there, the less women you see. This is how it goes, and you just have to reach the top. Women have vision. Women are as competent as men. This is the argument people say, well, no, women are just not good, they're not here, they're not there. They're everywhere. Women are everywhere, they're ready to work. They need access to opportunities. But and always, that's the point. The thing I always say is like, we know we will have succeeded when there are a lot of hacks, female hacks. <laughs> when, you're like, when you leave a movie, you're like, oh my god, that woman director was crap. You'll be like, yes! <laughs> And they still give you the money next time. Right, because yeah. right now everyone has to be Catherine Hardwick and Catherine Bigelow, right? Like these are phenomenal directors. Like let's just get some crappy ones. That'd be awesome. <laughs> How much time do we have? Uh, it's about 220. Okay. 220? That was a long time. <laughs> But you know, this touches on, you know, what are the, the practical things that we can do? Tessa and I talked about um, blind applications. No, this is all about um, relationships, but the orchestras have blind applications. You don't know who you're hiring, who you're based on merit only. Things that we can actually put into place because understanding the finance is one thing, but we are always, always, always gonna be pioneers, at least this generation and the next generation. So we should revel in web series and television and take it and do it and do the best we can. But how do we then move forward without turning into the privileged that are, you know? I mean, I would love, uh, so, what Beth is partially re uh, referencing is that at, in orchestras in the late 70s, they moved to blind auditions, so everyone took off their shoes, and it was behind a scrim, and now we have almost parity across American orchestras, um, and in fact, uh, St. Louis, I think, is a great percentage of women in the orchestras. Um, if you do that at the corporate or institutional level, you have similar results, and the small studies that have been done have shown that. And in fact, some of the small studies, studies in reverse have also shown that. So there's the Jennifer John study, which was a science study. Um, there were applications that were identical. One was named John something, and one was named Jennifer something. Jennifer was offered the job far less often than John, and when she was offered the job, she was offered it for far less money. Um, and so one of the things that if you and when you, young women and men and old, when we're in, 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 in positions where we can suggest and enforce institutional reform, if applications come in with names redacted, even at the first level, you have a very big, big difference in the hiring pool, right? So that's one like small and simple institutional reform that can happen. The confidence gap, which Beth referenced, which is you know where you see like a, a and I see it with my daughter. You see a boy, he gets four out of seven goals, and he says yeah, and my daughter will get four out of seven goals, and she'll say well I didn't really get the right angle on this, you know, and so she's apologizing for the three that she missed, right? So that creates just that huge gap about what job you go for or what thing you're apologizing for. That's something that I don't know is about institutional reform. I think that's about individual reform, family reform, thinking about those things differently. Nora and I met for the first time today, and somebody was um, introducing Nora as an award-winning filmmaker with a brilliant film, and Nora started to say, Sure, I didn't go that far. And then I, I saw she stopped herself. I saw her stop herself, and I was like, good. Look at that. <laughs> um, but I think that that's something that can really open up the conversation. Like, what are, on an individual level, there are many things we can be doing. And I believe, sadly, I do believe women actually have to be better directors than men now. I do think we have to be Catherine Bigelow and Catherine Hardwick. We do have to be that. Um, and so I think we individually can work to be better and rigorous, what Lorenz was talking about, about rigorously knowing the form, that's hugely important. Um, 
you know, Melissa, the work she's doing to just to have a megaphone on these issues, you know, on the internet, which is a, a fairly democratic platform. But all of us can be thinking about what are the institutional reforms in our micro institutions that can make a difference. Thank you, Beth. I have a, at the end of my presentation, I have a section called How Do You Can Make Change? And I just thought I'd put that up there for people before we close so that people, you know, this is not about all of us, it's about all of you. You have to be in this. It's, it's, it's for everyone. So here are some things that you can do in your daily life. And the first thing is go and see a movie by women. I mean, if you do not support women, you, they will not get more opportunities. And it's at the micro level, it's video on demand now. They're counting every single dollar, and it's at the movie theater. So um, we'll just page through this, and you guys can pick up what you want. There are a couple of things, you know, putting together panels, make sure it's diverse. Read women artists. Ask for the money, people. Ask for the money. Men ask for money. They ask for it more often, and they ask for more. And interrupt sexist conversations, which I think is really hard to do, but you need to do it. And then it's so important to be a role model in your life for the girls and the boys in your life. And then, OK, last thing is know your history. That was you know, what we saw in that documentary before, right? If you don't know, you're going to make the same mistakes. Know the history of where we all came from. Know the women's backs that you are standing on. We are not all, you know, it didn't start yesterday. Uh, the feminist movement, you know, it's been going on for generations. And um, we can, we're doomed to repeat it if we, if we um, don't know it. I just wanted to suggest um, another way to make change. It's, I don't know if it's gender related, but before I made my future, I was absolutely terrified. I had like panic attacks. I mean, I still have panic attacks all the time, but I had extra special panic attacks before I made my future. <laughs> exactly. And I think when you think about, I mean, you think about any movie, but I think there's like the great white whale uh, uh, idea about the making a feature. Everyone wants to make a feature film. And, um, or uh, maybe that's an assumption, but I think a lot of people want to make their first feature. And um, whether you're a boy or a girl, or you're in between, or whatever it is, um, just making it is the best way to you just combating that fear because the fear it creates paralysis it stops you from getting anything done and you know regardless of gender like just realize like oh, I made a movie like <laughs> you can make one too like oh yeah if people are afraid to do it just fucking do it yeah. it's awesome yeah. it feels yeah. so good. Yeah. documentaries, everyone has the dream to open in the theaters and have this big theatrical release, maybe see the numbers, see the statistics, you know, bottom line, the money people in some ways want the big billion dollar first weekend, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, don't underestimate, like you're saying, getting finished, doing shorts. I mean, the short film festival circuit now has just grown into its own industry and genre and subgenre. And then you can be out there as a director, you know, male or female, you can be out there with some finished content. And um, and I don't, you know, and it's such an exclusive club as it is, you know, and, and, and if you're a minority, it's even harder to crack through. I don't know if the whole, this argument of meritocracy and blindfold, I mean, I'd love that to be the case, but, you know, we see in some ways more people have cameras, there's much more technology available in terms of the money is really shrunk into a 1% versus a 99% world in a lot of ways. So, yeah, there are these VC folks running around, and some are women, you know, they're young, but they all, really, they're prancing around with pet projects that they're gonna fund. There isn't a sort of open call, let me look at some of the top this or that. They're just, and that's, of course, through additional connections. Like, how are just, quote, unquote, average people even gonna get to these VC people? I mean, it's just all of these gatekeepers, not to be the, you know, downfall or person here, but it's just, it's just reality, but you know, there's so many ways to skirt it, like just get finished with something, and then you can just be out there, and that I think is maybe the exciting takeaway, because you just see these staggering statistics, and it's, it is just staggering. It, it's, you know, um, so that's what I would say, try to stay in it, get finished, get out there, support each other, you know. There's a, it provokes for me a sort of fairly controversial question, which is about the diversity programs. And there are a number of diversity programs for women and people of color that, in fact, the DGA in its last 
um, negotiation forced the studios and networks to put diversity programs into place. Um, they're probably not going to be that effective, <laughs> but, um, but I'm happy to exploit them um, and I'm involved in several of them. Um, and I do think that that is one of the institutional reforms that we can, the reason, let me be clear, the reason they're not effective is because they do not end in an episode. They don't end in a paying job currently. I hope the DGA will at some point make that one of their negotiating points, um, but they don't currently. But I, my point of view on the diversity programs is that um, I don't feel pigeonholed by them, I don't feel marginalized by them, and I think they're there for me to exploit and get to the next level um, for whatever that's worth. There may be very controversial different perspectives on that. They may not be much, but there's something and I'll take it. That being said, a friend of mine who is queer, African American, and a woman says like, what are the conversations, so I'm in a meeting at ABC, and the guy is saying to me, well, have you heard about the diversity program? And she wants to know what's the parallel conversation happening for the guy. It's either yes or no, right? Um, so there's a lot to be said about that, but for what it's worth, like, let's just use what we got. That's my point of view. So are we done? We have no time for questions. Oh, yes, five minutes. Five minutes? OK. So we could go on all day, and if you'd like to continue this conversation, we can meet in the hall over there and talk more, but does anybody have any questions about what we can do, where we're going? Uh, uh, are there any mainstream national movements you would point out to that are either starting conversation with the public about you know, spending time and money where your values are, or with the men? And, you know, because I, I can see in my daily life there's a lot of the lies, men are lies, but they need to have their awareness raised also. So I'm wondering if you have like certain groups to point out to that we can start tracking them. And referring people to Film Fatales yeah. is an organization, a pure organization I'm part of. Um, but that's only for women directors. Only for women directors. And, and, and I was going to jump in about that. So we don't have a chapter here yet, but why don't we? Because there's a lot of good chapters <laughs> and it's feature film directors. It's very specific. But I think um, but Nora something. just founded the Film yeah. Patels, Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and there are a bunch of women directors in this room here today. And we've got Susan Smolowski, who is responsible for the festival and for putting on this forum. And we've got a lot of, we've got Lucinda Winter here. We've got a lot of really uh, kick-ass women in, in our own community. So there, there are things we can do at the grassroots level. Any other questions? I have a question about the AFI workshop you mentioned. What uh, did you take to get into it, and how did that help you? Did it project you into the, the professional? Um, it, so the AFI's Directing Workshop for Women is a program, the applications will be open fairly soon and they'll probably close applications earlier this year in November or December, so watch out for it. It is um, excessively hard to get into. Now it's like 2% of the applicants are in and it's, um, you have to have been working in the profession for at least three years, you have to have directed material to show, and then you have to have a strong short film or episodic script, and then the, then the applications sort of go through a vetting process. I think it's a phenomenal program. We're trying to look at ways in which we can serve more women because it's only available to eight or 10 women a year, depending. Um, but there's a lot of, yes, it's been very, very supportive. Um, I was a director and then I've become a career writer for a decade and I'm back directing again and it has catapulted me fully back into the center of the industry as a director and for which I'm hugely grateful. So it's one of the great things on the landscape. I also think, you know, I think Melissa's presence is a movement all its own. I mean, I don't mean that just to flatter my panelists. <laughs> But having, having voices and looking at places, and she's she's got her finger on the pulse of uh, gender and diversity and what's happening, and so there's no better place to look to see what's going on and to put and to know where to put your dollars. Thank you. That makes you feel so good. <laughs> so I I think that's it here. I'm sorry, and we're run out of time. So I just wanted to say a word or two that I could. I wanted to first of all thank you all. Thank you all for coming all this way to Minneapolis to do this panel. Uh, we're really honored to have you here. And I think this is just the beginning of something uh, that we're going to keep going uh, here. And I forgot to mention at the beginning of this panel that uh, of the 192 features in our festival this year, 
44 of them are directed by women. Now, if that sounds like a small percentage to you, let me tell you, it isn't. If you look at any other film festival around this country, you'll see that that percentage is much smaller. So we're making inroads already, and we plan to make many more. Um, I think with that, uh, again, thank you all for being here.